the very first time the Torah speaks about Shiduchim, arranged marriages, and the concept of marriage in general is the chasuna, the marriage of Yitzchak to Rivka. As we find that Avraham calls in his servant Eliezer and he tells Eliezer, swear to me that you will find a wife for my son Yitzchak and you will do this from my family. However, the mitzvah, the actual verse dealing with marriage is found in the book of Deuteronomy. In the portion of Kisese, there the Torah tells us in chapter 24, verse number 1, Ki yikach ish isha, when a man will betroth a woman. And the Talmud tells us there that a man can acquire and betroth a woman three ways, through kesef, through money, through star, through a contract, or through bia, through intimacy. However, nowadays, the law is that we betroth a woman through kesef, through money, which is translated to mean a ring, as we shall soon explain. And the Rambam, similarly, in the laws and the mitzvahs on the Torah, positive commandment number 213 says that the mitzvah of Kedushin, betrothal, and he quotes from Deuteronomy 24.1, if a man takes a wife and he lives with her. So here too the Rambam says there has to be an action that one does before one can actually marry a woman. And that is the concept of betrothal. In truth, betrothal is called Kiddushin. Kiddushin means holy. Of all the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah, the only mitzvah that is given the name Kiddushin, holy, is marriage. And that is because marriage is a very holy and a very important concept in Judaism and it has to be upheld and respected in a very holy and very respectful manner. What does the word Kiddushin mean? What does it mean that marriage is like sanctity? The concept of Kiddushin has two basic interpretations. As the Talmud tells us, number one, that Asar la kuli alma kehegdish. Why do we call this Kiddushin? that the bride now becomes prohibited to the entire world like Hegdish, like something that was designated or sanctified for the Holy Temple. In other words, up until now, she was allowed to date or, and, and meet other people. Now that she's getting married, she has to be committed to her husband. Number two, the word Kedushin represents the concept of, of unity. As it says in Tanya, Lies Miuchedes Imoi Biyichud Gomor, that she becomes dedicated and designated to her husband with a complete oneness and a complete unity. So, this is the second concept of Kiddushin. And we know that all marriages come from the original marriage of God and the Jewish people. Matan Torah. When the Jews received the Torah from God and Sinai, God was the groom and we were the bride and he lifted the mountains over our head. Mount Sinai was lifted above our head, that became the chuppah. And we accepted upon ourselves the commitment to God and God made us his people. There were two basic things that we had to do, positive commandments and negative commandments. And these are the two interpretations of Kedushin, of holiness. The word holy means, number one, separated. Havdallah, to separate. We separated from all the nations of the world by the fact that we follow the negative commandments, not to do things that the other nations do, not to eat treif, and, and not to eat chametz on Pesach, and not to break the Shabbos. And then, we also have the other aspect of Kiddushin, which is 
holiness, to be elevated in a complete unity with God, and that is through the positive commandments, through doing this, a mitzvah. The word mitzvah means connection. And therefore, by doing a mitzvah, we become connected to God. And that is why the standard liturgy of every bracha, before we do a mitzvah, is we say that God has sanctified us with His commandments. So through commandments, we become sanctified and we become married to God. So this is the basic peshat, the simple interpretation and the hira, and the lesson of marriage. What is the remez? What is the hint of marriage? As we explain that every mitzvah has four or five levels. The simple level, pshat, the remez, the hint, the drush, the hamaletics, the soy, the esoteric, and also the, the fifth level, which is chasidus. So the second level is, is remez. A remez is a hint for the future. What is marriage hint for the future? So the Medrash tells us that Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah on Sinai, this was the betrothal of God to the Jewish people. When Mashiach will come, that will be the ultimate marriage between God and the Jewish people. Now, years ago, there was a separation of 12 months between betrothal and marriage. A woman got engaged. And for 12 months, she prepared herself, she made dresses, and she put together china and, and foodware and cutlery to be able to have a beautiful Jewish home. And for 12 months, the man went and he started to build a home. He, he chopped down wood, and uh, he built rooms, etc., etc. But nowadays, we find that Kedushin and Edison, which means betrothal and marriage, take, together, take place one after the other. Under the chuppah, we do one and two. First, we do betrothal, the betrothal blessings, then we do right away the blessings of marriage. There's no separation between the two. And therefore, we ask of God, being that already He gave us a Torah and Sinai, and there's no separation between betrothal and marriage. He should marry the Jewish people and take us out of Golos. And the truth is, every day, every day we get up in the morning, we say the blessings before prayers. One of the blessings that we say is, We thank God for giving us the Torah. Baruch Atah Hashem, no sin Torah, blessed you God, who gives us the Torah. Every day God gives us the Torah anew. Every day we have Matan Torah. Every day we are once again betrothed by God. And therefore, right after that, we have to beg and plead and call out to God, no, it's time for marriage. You already did the betrothal, immediately come and do the nesuyim. Come and finish up what you started by marrying the Jewish people. This is the remez, the hint. We, might, we now move on to drush, the homiletics. Even though we established, as the Rambam said, that one can marry either through money or through a shtar, a document, or through bia, through intimacy. However, today, it's accepted by the world that we do it through money, through kesef. And in particular, we do this through a ring, as the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe, Moshe Israelish, who is the famous Ashkenazi Poisik codifier of the 16th century of Krakow, Poland. And he writes in the laws of Kiddushin and the laws of marriage, chapter 27, law number one, that he says, mm-hmm. that so is the custom that we betroth with a ring. And then he goes on to say, mm-hmm. and there are reasons for this which are found in the Zohar. So here, on one hand, the Ramah is writing a book of code, of halacha, which represents the revealed part of Torah. And yet, in the revealed part of Torah, he says, what's the reason? You look into the Zohar, 
which is the secrets of the Torah, and you'll find out the reason behind it. What is the reason? Why today do we do it with a tabas, with a ring? And even the Ramah does not mention this concept that we do it with a ring. And even the Bes Yosef, who organized the Code of Jewish Law, also makes no reference. The first one to make this public reference. And Allah is the Ramah. And that is the way the entire world does it today. So what's the reason behind it? And the answer is, in brief, that years ago, as we said earlier, there was a separation between the betrothal and the marriage. So you gave the woman, let's say, a hundred dollars, and say, I'm marrying you with the hundred dollars, and she had now time to spend the money throughout the year. After the year, she now meets her husband and they get married. Now, however, that the marriage, the betrothal and the marriage are both done under the chuppah, one after the other. So the husband now gives her, let's say, a hundred dollars. And a moment later, he marries her. She never had time to spend that money. She never benefited from the money. The law is, however, once you become married to your wife, if she has a field, even though the field belongs to her, you can benefit from the fruit. So, in other words, if you gave her the hundred dollars, you are now allowed to eat from the fruit of these hundred dollars. If that is the case, you never gave it to her completely. And the Dan tells us that the only way you can marry a woman is by giving the money to her completely that it becomes to her. However, the Dovash However, something that never left his hand completely, with that object she cannot become betrothed. So money today would not work. What does work? A ring. Why? For two reasons. When you give her a ring, when she's wearing it, you cannot wear it. So at that time she gets full benefit. Number two is, because it is a ring of a woman, a woman's ring, not a man's ring, we have a prohibition in the Torah that says, isha. A man is not allowed to put on the clothing of a woman. So he's not allowed to put on that ring. If that is the case, she now owns the ring, she has benefit from the ring, as is brought down in the Tesefta in Kedushin, that if you give a woman a vessel, she has to benefit from the vessel. It's not enough that you gave her a vessel or a garment for marriage, but she actually has to wear it and use it. And that's the reason why it's not enough that you give the woman the ring in her hand, but you have to put her onto her finger. That she's now actually wearing the ring and benefiting from the ring, and only that is the way that the husband can betroth his wife. This is the drush, this is the halacha when it comes to marriage. What is the soid? What is the esoteric? The Zohar tells us that, in essence, husband and wife are two halves of a soul that united under the chuppah. In other words, before the chuppah, they were two halves. And they're supposed to remain two halves. Before one's wedding, they are required to be separate and it is prohibited to become one. It is only through the wedding, through the chuppah and kedushin, that the wedding reveals how these two halves were truly one. What is the power of marriage? The power of marriage, the Kabbalah says, is that through marriage we reveal God's infinite power in the world. The power of the Ein Sof, which literally means to give birth to children. For no scientist in the world has the ability to create ex nihilo. The only one that can create life and nothing into something is God. And this power is given over to the chosen and the kala, the bride and the groom. So this power of ain't sof, this infinite power is revealed through the chosen and the kala. And this idea of ain't sof represents what we call in Kabbalah and Hasidis the Eiris Makifim, the all-encompassing lights, the surrounding lights. It's surrounding because it's beyond you. 
You can't really grasp it, even though you know it's there. And therefore, everything under the chuppah is connected with the concept of makif. On one hand, you have the chuppah that surrounds you. You cannot touch it, but you know it's there. Then this all-encompassing light gets closer. The woman surrounds the husband for seven times. Another level of makif. And then the husband puts a round ring around her finger. Another level of this surrounding light. Similarly, we know that there's a custom that the bride gives the chassin a talus, a big talus, a talus godel. Some do it on the way, on the day of the, of the wedding, some do it before. What's the concept behind it? So one answer is that we say in the Shema, uh, through the mitzvah of tzitzis, by putting on tzitzis, your eyes will not look astray. You will not follow what your eyes see. In other words, the kala, the bride tells the husband, look, till now when you were single, you had a right to look here and to look there because you have to choose for yourself a wife. But now, put on the talos over your eyes. Now you have no right to look anymore to other women, the only time you have to look is to me, for my eyes only, or for your eyes only. And therefore you give a talus. That's one answer. A pi chassidus, the answer is that the talus surrounds you. It represents the all-encompassing lights, the oiris makifim. And just like the talus goes around you, so too now it's a reminder that through marriage, as entering into marriage, God has given you now a new opportunity to access this greater light, to bring this light of God into the world. What does Chassidus say? It begins with a question that we find in the Pasha that Avram tells Eliezer to go and find a wife for Yitzchak. What does Avram do? Says the Medrish that Shtar Matona Kosav Li Yitzchak Akol Ashaloi. He gave Eliezer a document, a star. And in the star it said that all my money I give to Yitzchak. In other words, to impress the girl. You should know that this guy Yitzchak is a very rich guy. And therefore he has all this money. Look, we have an official document, notarized, with a signature, with witnesses, that all of Avraham's money is now being given over to Yitzchak, to Isaac. That's what the Medrash says. So the question is, if Avraham wanted to impress the girl for Yitzchak, he could have said, Yitzchak is going to inherit my money. He could have said, Yitzchak has 50% of my money, 90% of my money. Why did Avraham give everything to Yitzchak? Avraham still has to survive. He still has to live on his own. Why is he giving over everything right now to Yitzchak? And the answer that is given by the Rebbe is as follows. That Avraham Avinu realized that this marriage between Yitzchak and Rivka, the first Jewish marriage, it was not a private marriage. It was not two simple, quiet citizens getting married in a hall. This was a public marriage. It was famous people. It was Avraham that was known to be a king in his time a very powerful political intellectual who transformed the world. His son is getting married. And this is a marriage that will be a prototype for all generations to come. It's going to be the official kosher Jewish marriage. And all generations are going to look to see how to get married based on this marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka. And therefore, Avram Avinu understood that in order to ensure this Jewish continuity, it was not enough that he did his best. Many times people come to the rabbi, I tried my best, I gave it my best shot. 
comes along the Torah and tells us, you know, your best just ain't good enough. You have to give it your all. If you want things to work out, you got to give it your all. And therefore, Avram Avinu teaches us this lesson. If you want to make sure and you want to ensure that you will have Jewish children and Jewish grandchildren and that they will continue to go in the ways of God, it's not enough that you give it your best. You have to give al kol ashaloi. You have to give everything and invest everything that you have into this marriage and into this education to perpetuate Jewish life and Jewish continuity for all generations to come. And that is why Avraham gave everything, knowing that this was not only one marriage, but this was the beginning of a new nation that will continue until the end of time, until the coming of Mashiach. And this concept, says Chassidus, of the marriage of Yitzchak and Yifka, also represents the mission of creation. What is the mission of creation? The mission of creation is marriage. In Kabbalah we call this Yichud Ma Uban, the unity of Ma and Ban, which is the unity of the masculine and the feminine. This masculine and the feminine is a unity of body and soul, it is a unity between man and woman, and ultimately it's the unity between God and the Jewish people and God and humankind. When the entire humankind will appreciate and understand and acknowledge the unity of God, and when the entire world will become one with God, that will be the ultimate marriage and the purpose of creation. And this explains why the story of Eliezer, Avram's servant, going down to find the Shidduch for Yitzchok, is not mentioned once in the Torah, but is mentioned at least twice in the Torah. And every detail, over and over and over again. Yet we find many, many important mitzvahs, like the mitzvah of Shabbos. The Torah makes this commandment without any details. Keep the Shabbos holy. Okay, very nice. What do I do? We have to look into the tractate of Shabbos, and we find there are 39 malachas and 39 prohibitions, and there are many, many thousands of details of how to keep the Shabbos holy. Yet the Torah simply says, keep the Shabbos holy. In contrast to the story of Yitzchak and Rivka, an everyday marriage, an everyday love story, here the Torah not only says the details, but repeats the story at least twice. Why? To underscore that this is the entire objective of creation. To underscore that this is the mission of creation. To underscore that this is the purpose of creation. To bring about this yichud ma'uban, the unity between the masculine and the feminine, between God and the Jewish people. And we hope and pray that from this betrothal, the mitzvah betrothal that took place already on Sinai, we will move from betrothal right away without any separation into the actual marriage with the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. Amen.